we two are from Austria, and um, in Austria there is kind of um, a law that when you finish high school, like you would do pretty soon, every guy has to go to the military. It's mandatory. So there is no choice for you. You can't say I don't want to, but you can, you have to go to the military. It's mandatory for any guy. So either you go to the military for six months, and you basically waste your time there, um, because the Austrian military is um, nowadays really ridiculous. We've got a couple of tanks where like you, you have an education where like two months where you have weapon training, and then you just sit in an office and do nothing. And that's how the Austrian military works. And uh, that's what all my friends do. And they, you, they kind of waste their time. But then you have the choice. You can say, I don't want to handle any weapons. I want to have the choice to do something else. And um, the government came up with an alternative <coughs> called the civil service. So you work in a hospital, you work in a nursing home, you help elder people, and you just work for the community. And that's for nine months. So it's already longer. And then if you find out about it, which is really hard because the information flow is extremely bad, but if you find out about it, you can actually go abroad and do your civil service in another country. So um, Chris and me, we came to Canada, and that was before in the US and Los Angeles. And um, to, to, in order to do that, you have to like do a long, long thing. It's like one and a half years being in an organization, working for them for free. And then you probably get the funding to go abroad. But it's all the time probably and maybe and you'll see and all that stuff. So you take a lot of risks uh, to do that in order not to serve in the military and waste your time. Um, but to go abroad and to, to meet other cultures. And um, there are three types that you can choose from. The first one would be a social service. So that means you work in a country that is really poor and that needs a lot of development work. And you're coming from a richer country with probably more education. So you work there as an English teacher. You work there to help build schools, to build hospitals, stuff like that. So you work as a social worker in a really poor country for 12 months, for one year. The second possibility is you work in a country where there was war. For example, you can go to Hiroshima and work in an atomic bomb museum to uh, the documents the attacks of the Americans. And you're working there and you're um, telling the people what happened during the time. And you're helping other countries to cope with their past. And the last possibility, which we chose, is the Holocaust Memorial Service. And that's because Austria is highly involved in the Holocaust, as you definitely all know. And um, Austria wants to cope with its past, to work on its past, by sending people abroad to other countries that probably don't have the knowledge that we in Austria have, don't have the education, and give our education for it, give our knowledge for it, to tell people about our culture, what we have nowadays in Austria. And that's why we're here today in that classroom. Yeah, so, um, I don't know, how far are we? Um, Well, how to do this? You look so cute in that tight sweatshirt. That <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't parallel. How good you look in that tie? <laughs> <laughs> I tried popping your tie. <laughs> So we with the, the yeah, okay, that's cool. Um, all right, so you, do you guys know where, where on the map you will find Austria? Yeah. Yeah. Next to Germany? Okay, in oh, what direction yeah. of Germany? Let's say here's Germany. Where is Austria? I know the camera. Where is Austria in relation to Germany? Okay, fine. Oh, it's right. Good idea. It's basically in the south, but southeast. Yeah. So, so where I come from, Vienna, it's uh, more eastern and most of Germany. All right. So there's this little tiny country, Austria. Nowadays, it's really tiny. But um, to understand kind of the involvement of Austria in the Second World War, you have to go further back in history. Round about to the first big war. Ah, there we go. Beautiful. Okay, so that's a um, that's conscription. The military for six months, civil service for nine months, going abroad, 12 months. And that's what we're doing, Holocaust Memorial Service. Okay, 
um, why do we come abroad? Why do we do the whole thing? First, there is something called global responsibility. And that's particularly important in a time like ours, where you have connections to any other country in the world. Where you know people from any other co continent. You can like IM them, you can email them, and it's no problem. There, the communication is so easy, even over long distance. So the connections of people across the whole world got more intense and more important. And um, when you think of global responsibility, think of what effect you have on the environment. When you drive a really expensive car that has like a lot of, a lot of gas usage and um, really bad environmental like impact, then you then you damage the environment on purpose. You decide to do that. If you say I want to save the environment, I want to go on my bicycle, or I want to get an energy efficient car, then that's taking global responsibility. You help the planet. You help all the other people on that planet. In the same way that you have a responsibility for the environment, there is a certain responsibility for other people on other continents that you'll probably never meet in your whole life. But you've got a certain responsibility for them. Because they're also people, because they're also human beings. And this importance of taking global responsibility goes as far as to our program. You go to another country where you've never been before and talk to people about something that you learned from the past and probably you can help them learn too. And there you'll get your intercultural experience. I mean, Austria and Canada are so different. It's, it's really amazing to go to another country and not just to be there as a tourist and to see like the sights and stuff, but to actually live in a society and to integrate yourself and to learn a language. I mean, my French is still pretty crappy, but um, you just try to live another life among other people. And it's really interesting to find the differences between your own country and there where you go. Okay, and uh, my motivation is to learn from the past, especially about the wars, because you can see you have the same wars every 30, 40 years. It's very interesting, to, for example, between Germany and French. And uh, always for the same reasons. It's like about some, uh, some, some stupid things. And just to... to to know how it, uh, the hatred grew in these countries, how they started to the hostility and everything, and um, just to make yourself aware how it started, that you say, okay, now I'm starting to hate this country, and uh, I'm aware of that, and uh, let's prevent it, and how to then following that to prevent the genocide, to educate the people about the past, because we are we are the past, we are what happened in the past, it's our culture. Okay, so now that we've established where Austria is on the map, why does Austria get involved with Germany? What's the reason for that? Brian Kleinberg and Joseph. Alright. So those two guys, uh, they will probably never find out because they're not going <laughs> But uh, I'll tell you. So why is Austria involved with Germany? Let's go back. Let's not be in 1940 years. So let's go about, around about 40 years back, before the First World War started. Do you know how big Austria was at that time? Less? No, much more. Austria was bigger. Whoa. It was huge. It was huge. It was a world power. We considered ourselves like a really important factor in world politics. The, um, the people that reigned our country, the family that reigned our country for hundreds of years, they were really good at marrying other people. And through all those marriage politics, they would gain more and more and more land. And Austria was, before the First World War, was huge. We had our own navy. Like, that's completely out of the blue for somebody from today. But we had our own navy, we had sea access in Austria, yeah? Wasn't that like Austria-Hungary? Very good, very good. Austria-Hungary. Austria-Hungarian Empire, run by Austrians, and being connected to the um, Mediterranean Sea over Italy. So we had parts of Italy, we had Hungary, we had so much more. Then, what happened? Why did the First World War start? Do you know that? Or what's the initial point? Uh, what? Conflict between the Germans and the French. 
Yes, they definitely had a conflict and that was a huge factor, but there's like a certain release point. Assassination. Very good, assassination. Who was assassinated? Oh, the Tsar. Sorry? Wow. Something, or maybe. Something, maybe. <laughs> That's a really good answer. <laughs> the Archduke Ferdinand. <laughs> there we go. There we go. I don't know how I knew that. Okay, so Franz Ferdinand, the guy that would get the throne in Austria, the guy that would reign the Austrian Hungarian Empire in the future, the hope of our future, he goes to Serbia to present himself and to boast a little around, and suddenly he gets shot by a Serbian terror organization called the Black Hand. And so the Austrian government said, you just killed the guy that gets on the throne, so please at least um, you know, follow up on that and try to, to catch the people that did that. Uh, try to prosecute the Black Hand. And the Serbian government said, no, we're not interested in that. So Austria said, cool, then we'll declare war to you. And because Serbia was allied with Russia and Austria was allied with Germany and everybody else kind of wanted to have a war too, whole Europe fell in. And who won the war or who lost it? Was Austria winning the war? No. No. So from one day to the next, maybe a couple of years, but Austria suddenly got reduced to a really small, tiny thing on the map that hardly anybody knows. And so there's this huge thing going on in Austria, this complex of being like a powerful country before. And suddenly you're taking all away your land. Like, um, well, Quebec wants to separate from Canada. But <laughs> like, imagine just being reduced in a really small size, being a huge, powerful country before, and suddenly being small. Yeah? Kind of like what happened to Germany. Okay, very good. Germany. Germany got um, a lot of um, really important parts taken away. They were way smaller than what Austria got taken away. But for example, between the, um, Germany and uh, France, there is a certain area where there's a lot of coal mines, which is really important for weapon um, production, which is a really important fact for the economy there. And they um, put it to France, the Allies. After the First World War, there was like a huge decision who gets which parts of which of the losers' country. So Germany wasn't reduced as much, but it was definitely damaged and had to pay reparations to all the other countries. Austria had to do the same thing. All the losers had to pay. So imagine your economy is down and your land is minimized and you think, what the hell is happening? We just were such a cool country before and suddenly we're, we're losers. So there's a huge complex. There's a huge thing going on that Austrian people want to become powerful. They want to be part of something big. They want to see their country again in the news. They want to know that they're important in the world. And Germany same situation, losing after the war, really bad economy. But suddenly there's this guy, this guy named Hitler, and he's got a really good econ uh, economic plan. And people are following him, he's a great, he's a great um, order, he holds great speeches. And more and more people join him. And in 1938, uh, 1933, the Nazi government gets elected in Germany. And everybody believes him, that's the solution, that's how we can get back our power. That's how we can become an important factor in world politics again. And Austria, being right next to Germany, thinks, whoa, cool, now Germany's powerful, and before we were kind of friends, so why shouldn't we like, um, make a little arrangement? So, what happens is that in 1938, the Nazi government marches into Austria with a, a huge rally, and um, the Austrian people welcome Hitler. They say, we want to be part of your country. And, uh, and a couple of days later, Austria became part of Germany. It was merged into Germany. So it was, there was no more Austria, it was just the province of Germany. And uh, the Austrian people were proud of that, because now they were part of something big again. And that's how it looked like. All the people waving with the swastika flags and welcoming and uh, being really happy about it. <coughs> and that's uh, called Heldenplatz, which is a huge plaza inside Vienna. And the people, there were ten thousands of people welcoming Hitler, and he was driving this huge black Mercedes and like waving to the people. And they were so amazed by that. There were so many people there, and it was such a huge deal for Austria. Um, and probably, you know, they did kind of mock elections. Um, what do you think? How many percent of the Austrians voted pro joining Germany? 93. 93? <laughs> 84. Huh? 84. 84? 
100. 100? That is really close. We've got 99% of people voting pro-joining Germany. Pro-joining a country which with really questionable policies about racial discrimination. But nobody cared about it. They wanted to be, become powerful again. There was no question about whether they would be um, discriminating groups or not. Or most people didn't think of that. And there is a huge, um, like, a, it's a really important point um, in, in, in Vienna. And it's really famous, internationally known. And they have a banner, We Sing for Hitler. Okay, Hitler Youth. Um, do you know what Hitler Youth was? Yes. 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 Describe yeah. it shortly. What is it? The uh, young group. Yeah. Of it was the movement to get people, yeah. younger people, involved in the SS. Very good. Uh-huh. To get young people involved in Nazi politics. Yeah. yeah. And they set up camps. They set up camps. Yeah. Very good. Like Boy Scouts. Hold on. Oh. Eight-year-old boy yeah. with a uniform swastika, yeah. being totally proud to be a German boy. That was completely normal for those people. That was how their everyday life looked like. It was really prestigious when your child was in the Hitler year. That was, if your child wasn't there, then other people like looked at you with the disgust. So most parents tried to get their children into, uh, into the Hitler year. And since most of the friends were there, it was a really huge thing. Everybody wanted to be part of Hitler year. And um, it looks like Boy Scouts. It looks like a lot of fun. Does the Bundeshir still exist? The military force? The what, sorry? Isn't it called the Bundeshir? Bundeswehr. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Actually, in Germany, there's the same, um, the same policy as in Austria, namely that you have to join the army after you finish your high school. Okay, I wasn't here, my bad. Okay, Rob. So we have to skip the video. Yeah, so there would be a video, but never mind about it. It's basically showing you how Germany, uh, how Germany used propaganda to get people involved in something that's really questionable. And in that video, you'd see like children laughing like completely artificially, like ha 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 ha, and they'd be like all in a huge group. And in that video, there is nothing about um, racial laws, about how to judge people about how to be evil to other people. There is only fun, there is only this Boy Scout, this spirit, this, this, uh, this adventure in there. And that's how German uh, propaganda works. There is nothing about the bad parts. There is only the good parts. But that's a huge thing in, in propaganda. Only mention the good parts. Never talk about the bad parts. If people come up with criticism, ignore them. And that's how Germany works. If there was criticism, they ignored it. They put those people in jail, they shut them up. And they wouldn't show the public what was really going on. Or the public just found out about it or tried to say, no, it's not happening. So Aust- uh, Germany, being now um, like um, embodying Austria, Germany had a really good system for propaganda. And the Hitler Youth was a really good approach because you get young people who had not a lot of education, who probably didn't have a lot of diverse friends, they could get them in there. And get them involved and put those certain Nazi views in their minds. Yeah. Was the Hitler Youth only guys or was it Very good question. Cool. There's the Hitler Youth, and then there's uh, the German Mädel. And uh, it's a movement for German girls. And what would they learn there? What do you think? Cooking. How to how do girls. Like cook and so on. Very good. How to cook, <laughs> how to make the clothes, how to uh, yeah. fulfill their husband's needs. They would make really good German housewives out of them. Mocking it, or um, kind of uh, camouflaging it with German uh, uh, Girl Scouts. So they'd also go to camps, they'd also have fun. And all the videos were showing laughing girls and having fun and playing around. But basically they were telling them, you got to be a good housewife to be a good German girl. All right? And that's, that's how their whole system worked. They started in the very beginning. Eight-year-old kids, he saw this little boy, it's like, he probably knows how to multiply like two and two, and that's it. And he knows how to hate other groups, because that's what he gets taught. Okay, uh, it's about the Holocaust, we'll skip it a little bit because we're in a rush. And I'm sure you know that about all the events. So, why should I? 
No, I think I everybody in here is familiar with the events yeah. of the Holocaust. I think, you know, if we were in an, a school, a non-Jewish school, we would go into detail about the, you know, the key points, Kristallnacht, uh, the final solution, the fact that not only Jews were victims. This is an important thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, you see, yeah, not only Jews were victims. The, um, the Nazis were very selective, just the areas where they were So. All the political enemies, all the intellectuals were kind of enemies for the for the Nazi party. So one million political enemies were killed, five thousand to fifteen thousand homosexuals, two hundred twenty to five hundred thousand Roma and Sinti or uh, uh, two thousand five hundred to five thousand Jehovah's Witnesses, and seventy five thousand to two hundred twenty five thousand disabled people. Disabled people because they were not worthy to live more yes. because they were productive. Mm -hmm. What about black people? Is there you black didn't. Uh, there were. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, that's a really good question. And like when you research it, there is a real, the, the information is really rare about what happened to black people in Austria and Germany. When you go to Austria or Germany nowadays, you'll find really few black people there. Huh. You'll find a really small uh, difference in skin colors. There's um, c people from Eastern Europe and from Turkey coming in, but that's basically the most skin color variation you have there. So uh, black people are pretty rare, and for for like those figures, they were not important enough because there were just so few of them. But of course, Hitler portrayed them as um, as Negroes, as unworthy of living, as creatures, monkeys, all those kind of stuff. But it was they actually, were just a really small Toby, if you just let me interject for a second, it was, it was a great question because it was a horrible, horrific program which was conducted by, uh, they put people called Rhineland bastards actually in, in um, on display in kind of like prisons outdoor. These were, were children who were byproducts of German soldiers and Africans, any German soldiers that had been in the Boer War or whatever. And they had these people on display so people could come and see how their you know, their population was being infected. And it's it's actually something interesting to pursue. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. But Hitler was definitely against blacks because they had the Olympics in Germany yeah. and some of the some uh, black colors won or something. Yeah. And he was definitely yeah. Okay. Do Austrians remember? After Austria was uh, liberated by the Allies in 1945, uh, the Gesetz and the Anisverbotsgesetz was uh, made. It's a law against uh, making a new Nazi party. And uh, it forbids you to wear swastikas, to make the Hitler salute, to uh, to start a new Nazi party, and everything. But before, uh, during the Second World War, we had like 600,000 registered Nazi party members. In 1949, former Nazis were reintegrated in the government because they were needed. They had the knowledge, they had the know-how, they knew how to run the country. And very, very important for Austria is the Waldheim affair, Kurt Waldheim. He's a former UN general secretary. secretary general. Yeah. And uh, he ran for presidency in Austria. And before, Austria was always like, yeah, we were victims of Germany. We didn't do anything. We couldn't do anything. And uh, it wasn't our fault. And after the Waldheim affair, Austria started to think, okay, we were not really victims. We welcomed them. We were Nazis too. We did the too. And uh, that's a really, really important affair. Afterwards, Austria started to uh, to accept this role as a perpetrator in the Second World War. You can see it's a memorial in Vienna. It was kind of rumor because it portrays the Jew again as a victim, and it portrays the Jew as uh, cleaning the streets after the night of broken glasses. And uh, the artist had to put barbed wire on it because people sat on it. Okay. I know that you want to say Yeah, no, I think this is really, really important because this this uh, memorial of an Orthodox Jew cleaning the street, which, you know, most people, when you see it, you can easily mistake it for a dog. I mean, it's just horrible. And at the time, when that was erected in the, in the 80s, there was such an outcry in the, the Jewish world that um, Simon Wiesenthal 
actually started a, a campaign to re-erect a proper memorial commemorating the people who perished in Austria, the Jews who perished. But when you compare that that little statue there to the statue that was erected um, on the right-hand side to the victims of Mauthausen, I think it really puts in perspective um, the difference between the political prisoners who perished in Mauthausen, okay, and the Jews who perished, because it's not a very clear picture, but those um, big blocks at the bottom are supposedly uh, stones from the Mauthausen quarry that the political prisoners had to carry up the famous death stairs, and you know, I mean, this, the size says it all, I mean, in terms of the loss of life, what, what was valued or what wasn't valued, what is commemorated. You know, it's the old saying, pictures worth a thousand words. So, anyway, after Wiesenthal set up his uh, quest, the next slide is, is what was erected it in the Union yeah. And it, uh, you can see here, these are all books, uh, Porches books, and the other way around because uh, it's for all the victims, all the Jewish victims during the Second World War and uh, it's because the Jews are like seen as the, the culture of books, the yeah, literature and the Then German propaganda. The Germans were really, really extremely good in propaganda. So every German household had a radio which was really new at this time and uh, it was called the Volksempfänger and they always uh, could hear the, the Hitler speeches and uh, when he was talking about all the different races, about the war and how strong the German race is. Then posters, like, yeah, posters like political posters. Newspapers, the Völkische Beobachter und der Stürmer, these are really still famous propaganda newspapers. And cinema, because at this time we, nobody had a, a own television. So the people went to cinema to see the news, and of course the news were not full of propaganda. They were not objective. Okay. Yeah. Here you see a poster: German guy, blonde, tall, blue eyes, and like uh, the workers give him the weapons because now they have to fight against the enemies. Okay. Here you can see a German uh, standing in front of a Jewish uh, shop and it says Deutsche Werte, uh, like Germans defend, don't buy in Jewish shops. It was like at the time when they started to uh, isolate the Jews to expel them from public life. This should be uh, seen as a documentary, it's called The Eternal Jew. And uh, that's very important because that's how the Germans portrayed the Jews. They, they wanted to, uh, to make a connection to dehumanize uh, Jewish people and to make them look like rats. And that's how, because if you ask yourself how could it happen that the guy in a, in a concentration camp could just shoot like 10 people go home and play with his children again, it was because the propaganda was so extremely good shooting a, a Jew or an enemy it was not like shooting a human being, it was shooting like an animal, like a rat, like a parasite. Okay, the video doesn't work. So. Uh, that's the ballot for the annexation for <laughs> Austria. Wow. And, uh, yeah, it's, circles, the size of the circles. it's uh, quite obvious that they want you to vote. And uh, you have to imagine that at this time, it was not like um, a guild action, you know, in nowadays where you have your own family where you can sit and decide. There were like uh, members of the German uh, army or SS standing next to you like, uh, don't you want to vote? Yes. Wow. And it's quite obvious what they want you to vote. And that's how they influence the people all the time. The stereotype and uh, use the media. This is like... I think the question is a little bit obsolete. But it's, um, Normally, the question is, who you know, who, like who, Jewish guy. who is Jewish, who is Jewish in, in the picture? picture. Yeah. And um, clearly, everybody is Jewish in the picture. Yeah. But most people respond immediately by saying the person in the middle because that's a very difficult notion of a Jew to non Jew. But in fact, everyone there is Jewish. Yeah. And then, of course, the distinction between Judaism as a culture, a religion, a, you know, an identity yeah. is brought up. Stereotyping. 
This is uh, the one in Vienna? Yeah, this is at the House of Milan. It's this the National Day. Okay, it was like the National Day, and uh, the army showed, showed what they had, all the weapons, all the tanks. And here you can see the children playing with it. That's in Australia last year. In October of last year, yeah. See the boys training with the weapons, mm. using the weapons. That's the Pope when he uh, went to Austria. And uh, here you can see that Austria still sees himself or itself as a very Christian country. It's like you have the churches in every small village, and it's like a big event if the Pope comes. This uh, actually, this is taken, uh, I was there, I took these pictures in October of this last year. And what this is, is a gathering of the military in that same square where you saw the people meeting Hitler. It's called the Hausenplatz. And it's, I mean, I don't think Christian and Tobias see it the same way I see it. But to me, it was a, an incredible like, day of, of glorifying the military, of showing, I saw tens of thousands of parents bringing their kids around to these guns, machine guns, and put, getting them on the machine guns. There were kids doing, like, not bungee jumping, but going across as they're simulating air, you know, parachuting and that sort of thing. And it was all to glorify the role of the military. And yes, the military today is a so-called peacekeeping, it's, it's civil service, but still, in my mind, it has a latent function of glorifying what Austria once was. And this was a photograph on something, I mean, it was a building, it was a press building. And the photograph was absolutely huge. It was about three times the size of that wall over there. And who is there? Pope Benedict himself, along with representatives from the Austrian government. And again, you know, for me, it's the manifest reason of why that's there is who knows. I mean, I guess it's, it, it's clearly, it's obvious that, the, that Catholicism is a really important part of national identity in Austria. Yeah. And I think this helps to shape identity, this kind of message which is there with the kids, so, you know, when you're putting your five-year-old on a tank and showing them how to shoot. So that's it's just a little bit of, you know, how, how our identities are shaped. And it's really true. Austria sees itself really, really strong as Catholic. For example, uh, uh, the leader of the, of the right-wing party. Because in Austria you have the only immigrants are uh, Turkish and uh, Eastern Europe, and uh, it's like the Muslim culture. And they really, they really fear this culture. For example, uh, once the, the leader of the right, far right wing party, he said something like, "We won't have the the, the half moon," <laughs> because he was really afraid that we will have the half moon everywhere instead of the cross on the churches on the highest buildings. And uh, Austria is Catholic, definitely. Yeah. And that's uh, media today. It's, uh, we did it yesterday. If you just uh, put in Muslim in Google and what pictures you find, what is like the typical Muslim? And you see a woman covered, uh, a guy uh, shouting. And, uh, I don't know, can you see all these pictures? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, what else? That is very beautiful. A picture with the powers. The yeah. 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 Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> what else? Okay, and the next one is Christian. What do you see? Crosses. Crosses. Just crosses, yeah. And <laughs> And then uh, Jew. <laughs> the first hit in the web image. The first hit is really yeah. like the second one is except the caricature. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Is that done international? Nothing American. Yeah, too much. What's he doing here? <laughs> Uh, 
the fourth one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Also, no, oh, yeah. Yeah. You see, you see there's still a lot of sulfur gas. You can't do that. You do the search. You just type in Jewish there or Jew? Jew. When you put in Jew, or Muslim or Christian, you'll get the whole thing. Oh, there's a girl for you. It looks a little weak though, I think. Okay, what is that called on the left? What is that image? The image, uh, it's very important because they can uh, see the uh, film with us. Is it a TV channel? Yeah, it's uh, in, the, in the US, you have a military channel, which yeah. basically 24 7 displays the great actions of the American military and how awesome they are and how much you should better join them. And if you can access the TV, you'll get a podcast. Yeah, that's convenient. It's the exact same thing. And here you can also see a beautiful woman. Um, like it's a, it's an ad. Like uh, if you are strong, you look beautiful. And like women should get more strong. They should train. They should buy these products. <laughs> <laughs> and that's quite obvious what they want you to do or what they want, how they want to portray a woman. It's seven reasons you need to lose weight. <laughs> it's like to, to make a woman uncomfortable to have a little bit more. Who is that? It's a girl. It's a girl. It's a woman. Thank you. <laughs> Robin Williams. That's propaganda. Right. What does that say? Wide oh pride worldwide. Very good. White pride worldwide. Uh -huh. um, do you know what the white supremacy movement is? What it's all about? KKK. KKK. Very good. Yep. KKK is a part of the white supremacy movement. What else is there? But what is what is the whole white supremacy movement basically says? What is the mission? Of somebody who says, I'm a white supremacist. I believe in. Sorry? Just put up your hand. Just put up your hand. The white are superior Very good. The white skin color is superior to any other skin color. That's what they're promoting. That's what they're believing. And when you go on that webpage, probably it's a little obvious what they want, what they believe. But there are other web pages which are really covering up what they think. For example, there is a sports informational page about um, football. And. Um, You've, you've got a list, white football players, black football <coughs> players. Really? Okay, so it looks pretty legitimate. They just um, categorize um, the people by their skin color. That's probably a little weird, but you'll go to the web. Yeah? Are they, are, they, are they like white or better than, than any other race, or do they also think... Like our Jews left. Jews do everything. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. KKK is like, it's like, it's yeah. doesn't mean like a uh, white kid who was stopped. Yeah, that's a, right, it's um, like KKK yeah. is really strong, yeah. like the I think so. Christian yeah. party yeah. is an anti-other religion yeah. party. Aren't they like anti-Jews in the Yes, yeah. yeah. they are kind of like, they don't want to be belong to any uh, religion, but like, but certain people are going to be the back of the I mean, every white supremacy group has a certain main target that they want to target. And then when you go on that one web page, you get white players and black players. And on the white players, the, it, uh, it says what they achieved, how great they were, how fast they are, what records they set, how cool they are, what a great education they got. And when you click on the black players, it says what um, penalties they, they got, what um, crimes they did commit, how many people got murdered because of this one black player, and all that stuff. It's called selective information. And that's what the Nazis used the same way against Jewish people. They said, all Jews are rich. That's called selective information. You take some piece of information and you say, it's for everybody. It applies to everybody. So you say, all white players are really good. There are no criminal white players. And you say, all black players are criminals. All black players want to kill you. And that's what this uh, web page delivers. And there is nothing in that web page which says, pro-white supremacy or so. It just... It, uh, it, um, it drags you in. It puts beliefs in your mind. You go next friend to your uh, the next day to your friend and say, "Dude, I read this about those black players, and I mean they're all criminals. You know, like all black players are criminals." And that's how that stuff works. They um, inflict mouth propaganda. They inflict mouth to mouth messages. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, can you tell me like? Like what, like what your grandparents told you about the time of like the war in World War Two? Like how, how, 
How's David? Like, that's not what was going on at that time. Very good point, yeah. Um, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll go on the, the right now. Um, Can answer that later? Okay, if, if, uh, if it's okay for you, then we'll do like average and we'll think. Is it, is it cool for everybody? Yeah. Yeah? yeah? yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so you hear a perfect example of the white guy protecting this beautiful white girl of the black rapist. <laughs> <laughs> and it's made like a comic, so he's taking his dick and beating his brain out and the eyes are popping out. Isn't that funny? Some people think, oh, I'm oh, so cool when I see that stuff. <laughs> and that's how any racial joke works. If you tell a joke about black people, if you tell a joke about Asian people, probably it's funny. It's a racist joke, but it's fun. Come on, it's, it's not special. Any racist jokes plant a certain idea in your head. And this certain idea can grow, but it will not go away. That's how all those racial discrimination propaganda works. People put certain ideas in your head, and as soon as you memorize them, as soon as you think about them, you already they become part of your identity. They become part of you, and there is no way you can get them out. The only thing you can do with those ideas, the only thing you can cope with racial jokes in a, respect, uh, a respectful way, is to realize that you are showing hatred against other groups, and you're, then, you're doing that on purpose. Even if it's hate, having fun, and if it's cool, and if your friends lo- laugh about it, and if you're more acceptable in your uh, little social circle, it plants a certain idea in your head. And that idea can be damaging the people around you, because you probably start to become really hateful against a certain group. Probably you'll just be a little like underground, like, I don't like those guys. Probably it will grow. And even if you're just like, okay with it, then you'll be okay with what other people do. And that's what happened in Germany. A lot of people were okay with, oh, we don't like the Jewish people, you know, they're all so rich, they're taking their money, but I don't really have anything against it. And when something happened, they were more accepting what was happening. They were more okay with what was going on. So if you're okay that a certain group gets discriminated, then you're probably also okay with that them being um, killed in a long period of time. That, of course, like in Germany, it's not from one day to the next. It's a long period of time where there was a lot of progressive development in the propaganda that Hitler did, that Goebbels did. And those people really knew what they did. They really knew how you can turn around nearly 80 million people in Germany, Austria, and the whole German Empire at that time. And how you can make them believe that it's okay to have those people suddenly shift away with trains and nobody knew where they would go. That. Oh, isn't it cool? The white guy is distinguishing, uh, extinguishing the Jewish spider. Extinguishing. Extinguishing. And uh, like the text, it's, it's crazy, like how you can use a joke to um, promote a certain idea. And nobody in the classroom will find that funny, but probably some people will find this picture funny. And if they find it funny, they already get this idea of the Jew being an animal. Better go and go around with the guest and and that's, that's pretty obvious uh, what they want and that um, you know Hutu and Tutti? Where was there? Yeah. Rwanda. Rwanda. Rwanda, very good. Rwanda genocide. And that's um, how the ten Hutu commandments, that's how they wanted to kill the Tutti. Just kill those people that look this way. Okay, who remembers that? Where's that? 2004. Oh, that was in a, in a jail. That was in a jail, very good. It was holding a, a, war, a war prisoner. Yeah. Oh, I think I know. Abu Ghraib. Yeah, I think that's the name. Yeah, it's, it's in Iraq. And um, that was a huge deal. How? If you have a certain idea, you want to pro- promote a certain idea, you could use this picture for what? What would you use this picture for if you want to promote a certain idea? What idea would that be? Show that uh, whites are superior than blacks. Okay, you could say that the, the guy is not black, but like Iraqi, but you could probably say they're superior, okay, yeah. But seen in a more sense of positivity, that's actually using propaganda. What do you think about war? Do you want war? Criminals should be tortured. Criminals should be tortured, okay, that would be another thing. But actually, like, this humiliation scene is already so disgusting to pretty much everybody who sees it, that there's a really strong negativity about it. 
What you could use this picture really well for is putting it in a huge banner and going to an anti-war demonstration, an anti-Arab war demonstration, an anti-American army demonstration. And even if you think that it's morally right to have no war, which is probably very true, I don't like war at all, but that is propaganda. You use this picture and you probably put on a banner, American soldiers are torturing Iraqi people which is such a general way to describe it. There, are, there is a little group of American soldiers which do really disgusting things to people, Iraqi people in a prison, but that does not say that every American guy is like that, that every American army person does stuff like that. It just shows that a little group of people does that, but you can use this picture for really powerful messages. And that's how the Nazi propaganda works. They use this picture that the um, he picked at this one guy and said, all of those guys are like that. That's how they work. That's how they, for example, says this here. It says, distorted music. It portrays the black guy like a monkey with a Jewish star. So basically, all of what the Germans did not like, they put together in a picture and said, the jazz music is disgusting. Okay, and um, so in Austria... We probably think Austria um, facing the genocide in the um, in the in the 40s uh -huh. being probably okay today, um, like coping with their past, sending people abroad to talk in schools. Probably they learned about the past. Well, they probably did learn about the past, but a lot of people have no idea how they shall apply what they learned about the past to their current situation. And then here is pretty current. It's 2006, and it says our home instead of Islam our home instead of Islam. This party wants no Islamic culture to come and override our beautiful Catholic culture because they could like take away our ideas, they could put their stars everywhere. Those people seriously think that the Islamic culture is um, threatening Austrian identity. And that's how they promote their ideas. And um, what happened was in 2006, this party did not get like the, the main vote or so, the two biggest parties, like the Democrats and the Republicans, got it. They made a coalition, and they started quarreling and discussing, and they couldn't get along with each other. And after one and a half years, they said, okay, you know what? It's over. We'll just make re-elections. So all the people got really pissed that they had to go to elections again after one and a half years, which is really complicated. You have to go to building income X. So people got pissed at them. They said, they're still like, they're not able to make government. Let's, let's elect some other party. And they had a choice either two extreme right-wing parties like this here, or the Green Party. And the Green Party had the pretty bad PR at that time, public relations. And um, how many percent do you think got those little, like, they're usually really small, extreme right-wing parties that promote hatred against foreigners? What do you think, how many percent? 26. 26, that's a very good guess. That's, it's 30%. So those together, 30%. 30% of people voted pro a party that says we want no Muslims in our country. We want all of them to go out, go away. In a country where there happened a genocide 60 years ago that started with the same stuff. We want those people to be out. We want them not to be part of our society. They're threatening us. They're um, tearing our, uh, our economy down. That's how this whole stuff works. And you probably have to think Quebec too, you probably have to think Canada or in the US, that certain groups are targeted because people don't like them. And through this targeting and political campaigns, you start to progress. And it's a long slope. And in Germany and Austria, it went all the way through. It went from targeting certain groups to a genocide, to killing over 6 million people just because they have a certain religious belief just because they are, at that time, really good scapegoats, and because anti-Semitism was really predominant in Europe. It was always somewhere under the surface. That's the same thing that I mentioned before. When you say, ah, I'm kind of okay with it. This thing, I'm kind of okay with it, this under the surface thing, that's what Hitler used. That's what was made him so powerful in targeting um, the Jewish group as a main scapegoat. Because he could use this old belief of European people that is there since thousands of years uh, and use it for his ideas, use it for his political agenda. And um, this guy here, he took a little more modern approach in the elections, namely, he would rap. And, uh, <laughs>
pretty appeal, catchy tune, huh? The appeal was to the youth, yeah, the yeah. young people, exactly. and you say that they voted in large numbers. Overwhelmingly. Really? So at that election, they were not getting so much um, uh, votes, but at this election, they had certain other things like comics. The, the, um, this guy is called H. C. Strache, and there was like the Strache man, he was like a superman, and he would rescue the, the poor little Austrians of those immigrating Muslims. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, what age could you start in Austria? Uh, you can start voting at um, basically 16 for a local thing, and wow. 18 for a national. Okay, 16 national. So from age 16 on. Um, Same age, you can start to do it here as well. Yeah, yes. We're um, almost at the end, so if anybody has questions, oh, yeah. I think this is the time. Maybe you want to answer the question that was asked to me. Right. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. So, um, so, so, where are you going? Oh, what was the question for the parents? Yeah, like, what, what were your grandparents like, saw you about, like, that time, like, how they felt? Uh, okay, for example, my grandfather never talked about the war, never. But I know that he was uh, in the German army, he was trapped in Africa and came to Canada in the camp. He was in a POW camp, uh, which is very interesting. I don't know if you're aware that there were about 25 German prisoner of war camps that in, in Canada. There was one actually very close here called Il Nozo. And after the war, these people were then sent back. Yeah. Sent back, yeah. Here, I think they had like uh, get rid of the Nazi thing. They had to again, like teaching them education, not the uh, democracy. And uh, my uh, grandmother, because they were on a farm, she told me after the war, they had like all the people you know that didn't have anything to eat, all the people who came out from the from the concentration camps, because what is not very far away from them, and. Uh, it was like people didn't have anything to eat and they had like these special signs in the trees on the um, different uh, farmers and they knew if it's a good sign that they can go there and get something to eat if it's a bad sign they will uh, probably put them away or uh, in the worst case shoot them and it was like yeah we, had this, we saw it that we have these signs in the trees and the people came to us and could eat with us but normally my grandparents didn't really talk about it are, are people like ashamed of that time? Uh, Shane, I, I don't know what happened to my grandfather. It was war. Normally people don't really like to talk about war. Uh, so the like for, uh, for my grandparents, one part of my family comes from Germany and one from Austria. And uh, my one grandfather um, fought in the... They both fought in the German army. And the one went to Russia and the other one went down to France. They both didn't get killed during the war, uh, but my one grandfather was in a um, Russian camp where he uh, like nearly froze off his toes because they like they pushed him in the ice cold river and stuff. So like there, there are a lot of dirty stories, um, and usually who tells them is my parents. My both grandfathers are dead now. Um, it's usually the parents that tell their kids about what the grandparents yeah. witnessed during the war because people are usually really uncomfortable talking about that. Um, since many of them had no interest in fighting in the war. My grandfather, the last thing he wanted to do was to go and fight for the Germans. He, he felt like he was an Austrian farmer. He had no interest in fighting. But they came and if he wouldn't, went, uh, wouldn't have went to the war, they would have um, done something to his family and he didn't want that to happen. So most of the people were there involuntarily. And my other grandfather, he was um, in a French camp that like a huge um, soccer stadium where they would gather together all the um, former German soldiers and look what happened to them. And um, so he went uh, back home like was like worse than hitchhiking. They would like steal little um, railroad things where you like push yourself over the tracks and they would try to find a way home to Germany. And actually, <coughs> what's really interesting is when he arrived in the little village that was in front of his village. There were just like two miles or so to go. There was a huge group of people from the concentration camp, former inmates from a concentration camp, coming towards him. And they saw he had a German uniform. They saw he had nearly the same uniform that those SS guards had that killed their families, that killed their children. And so they wanted to kill him too. And he was completely alone. He was like out in the field. And shortly before they came to like just beat the hell out of him and kill him, an American truck came and um, said, guys, the war is over, and that guy is just like a civil person now. And they took him in a truck and they drove him home and nothing happened to him. And then in the aftermath, 
where um, a lot of um, like the where the Russians and the Americans and the British and the French were in Austria and in Germany to like control the government to control what's happening. Um, a lot of Russian soldiers. There was a huge problem in Austria. The Russian soldiers were just like Russian and like plunder the farms and uh, often rape the people there. And uh, in Germany, there were a lot of uh, like my my grandma. She had to um, to let people live in her house, like the uh, Russian soldiers. But that was way less worse than what could have happened. So yeah. What other questions? Um, so you said that you said that everybody who graduates from high school has to do one of these things, right? Yeah. What do most people choose to do, or there's just it's, it's like a big mix. Kind of um, it's I think that most people definitely choose military yeah. because it's the shortest one. They don't do it because they can fight in an exciting war because Austria is not involved in any exciting wars and can be like an by Switzerland. That's how big our army. Is. And um, most people choose to go to the army because it's the shortest. And um, like a third of the people probably go to civil service, and the people that go abroad, us, is probably 30 out of more than 20. But that's not because we're so special or so cool, but because we found out about it yeah. because we pursued that for like more than a year to get it. It's a persistence. And most people just want to go studying, so they say, let's go to the other social media. Other questions? Yeah. 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 Um, how long are you abroad? Um, one year in total. So yeah, I, I split my service between Los Angeles. You can you can split your service and you can go for one year. You have to choose where you go. Yeah. You have the free choice, but wherever you want to go, you gotta work on it to get there. So probably you'll have to wait for more years if you want to get there really fast. <coughs>